walk away from you, and he will not leave you like you are. He's going to heal you. He's going to heal you. Three months ago, if I didn't take $80,000 list price of medicine a year, I was crippled with arthritis. I hadn't taken it for three months. When God moved us here, God did a new thing in our lives. That ain't part of the message. That's just free. You get that for nothing. (laughs) But God desires to do a new work in your life. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He keeps on doing the same stuff over and over again, which just like when he spoke into the darkness and said, let there be light, so he speaks into our lives today. Every time he speaks into us, every time he touches us, he's continuing that initial work of creation when he recreates us. He didn't just build you in your mother's womb. He continues to build you every moment of every day. And he desires to do that in your life. Well, we just got through with Christmas. And I know that this is a Pentecostal church, but Lent needs to begin. Lent needs to begin probably this afternoon, at latest tomorrow morning. And we don't just need to fast for 40 days. You need to fast all the way until at least Easter, maybe even (laughs) 4th of July. (laughs) You know, I don't think much of um, New Year's in the sense of New Year's resolutions. Because most of it's a bunch of foolishness that if it needed being done, we should have done it already. But we say it because, oh, well, you know, it's going to be January the 1st. Like God cares what numbers are on a piece of paper on our calendars. (laughs) But just a few days ago was the 21st. And on the 21st was the winter solstice. Shortest day and longest night of the year. And I tell you what, after living in the North Country, after living in Snow Country, you pay attention to things like that because the day after the winter solstice, the days start getting a little bit longer. You get a little bit more daylight. You know, the day is probably like six, seven minutes longer now than it was just five days ago. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, I will take it. Send all the warmth and daylight you want to. When we get to the solstice, we turn that corner, we stop that descent into darkness, and we begin to climb into light and warmth and life. Yeah, I know the trees are bare and there's no leaves on them now, but you know the trees are preparing for the spring. The trees are preparing for the coming of that new life, that new growth that's going to be bursting forth in them in just a couple of months. And it may seem in your life that the trees are bare and they got no leaves and it's all dead, but oh no, because see, God's just harboring and restoring that strength so it can burst forth in new life in your life. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. Though the trees are bare, the sky is gray, and the air is cold, yet everything in the whole northern hemisphere is preparing for the new life. So are we, and so is God in us. So this is a good time for introspection, to take stock of ourselves. So how are you going to face this new year? Have you thought about that? Our grandson's showing up on a plane tomorrow, and we're going to go down to see her mom in southern Alabama. And since it's so close, we're going to go down to the beach, Panama City Beach, for a couple of days. I'm going to fish off that pier down there with the boy. Now, typically what we would do on Friday, if we were home, we would prepare a special meal. Black-eyed peas, cabbage, and cornbread. How many of y'all have something you eat on New Year's Day, huh? You know, I've talked to people all over the world. A few years ago, I kind of had an idea with this. They say, well, you you eat black-eyed peas, cabbage, and cornbread for good luck. Now, I don't particularly believe in luck and fortune as a random sort of a thing, but this kind of struck me, and I have talked to people all over the, literally from all over the planet, from every culture, and almost every culture on their New Year's Day, they have something that they eat. 
Now, they'll usually put it away. Yeah, it's good luck for the coming year. You know, I've, I've thought about this. If you are content on the first day of the new year to eat the simplest and most common of foods, and what is simpler than peas or beans, greens, and cornbread? And people all over the planet, many of them, will have this, this custom of eating this simple meal, a simple common meal. And you know what? If you are content to feed your body that on the first day of the year, if you enter into the year in that manner, in such a simple, calm, established way, then yeah, you're probably going to be all right for the rest of the year. Besides, I could eat black-eyed peas, cabbage, and cornbread every day and hardly get unhappy, except for the other days when I want jambalaya. So I don't have a new word for you today. I want to go back and touch something old. So I want you to open your Bibles up to Psalm chapter 1. Or actually, it's Psalm 1, not chapter 1. Psalm 1. And if you would, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. You know, they started doing that when they went back and rebuilt Jerusalem. Psalm 1, reading out of the New King James. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we have gathered together in this place to worship you. Not for us to do a man's religious thing, but for you, Lord, to do a God thing among us. So I ask, O oh Lord, for you to open our ears. Not just our ears on our head, but on the ears of our spirit, Lord, that we can hear the voice of your spirit speaking to us today. I ask you to anoint and open our eyes that we can see what you have to show us. Anoint our minds, Lord, that we can just plain old understand what you want to tell us today. But most importantly, Lord, we ask for you to anoint our hearts, that our hearts would be like that good soil that has been tilled and prepared to receive the engrafted seed of your word. If we are encumbered, Lord, by briars and brambles or the cares of this life, then Lord, crank up your holy bush hog and run it over the top of us. Cut that mess down, Lord, that we can follow you with everything we have, that this that the seed that you put in us may bring forth much fruit in our lives for the kingdom of God right here, right now. In the sweet name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. What kind or genre of literature are the Psalms? Poetry. poetry that's right. It's Hebrew poetry, to be more exact and precise. You know, the Bible's full of all kinds of different sorts of literature. But the Psalms is some of the poetry that has got in here. I love poetry. I will confess to having a college degree in English literature. I had to learn other things in order to get a job. But I still like liter English literature, and I like literature of all things. And when you look at this, you know, English poetry is kind of rhymy dimey like you know. Roses are red, violets are purple, sugar is sweet, and so is maple circle. <laughs> That's how you know it's poetry, when it rhymes on the end. Now, not all poetry rhymes on the end, but an awful lot of the poetry in English does, and in most other Western European languages. But the trouble with that is that it doesn't translate very well, because, well, here, I'll use you for a minute. you got the right color on. What color is her sweater that she's got on? Roll, red. Roll oh gosh, I walked right in, oh. I'm from Louisiana, y'all, I went to LSU. We love you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's red, beautiful red too. 
and I do root for Alabama when they ain't playing LSU. So we got red. What color is that on a Spaniel? Roja. Wow, if I've got a rhyme and it was red, the word red in there, then when if I tried to put it in Spanish, Roja, it's not going to rhyme anymore. What is it uh, en Francaise? Rouge, like Baton Rouge, where I come from. See, this is the trouble with other poetry. When you try to translate it, if it's rhymey-dimey, the words don't rhyme anymore and it doesn't work. But you see, God had a plan and a purpose when he enabled the Hebrews to develop their poetry. See, they don't rhyme syllables. They rhyme ideas. Yeah. They rhyme ideas, and what you can have, you can have the statement of an idea, and then you can have its opposite. This is great, but that thing's bad. Or you can have it ascending, like good, better, best. This thing's good. I want you to know it's better than anything else. No, I mean, it's the best that you can find. Or you can have it descending, too. This thing is bad. I mean, it's horrible. No, I mean, it's absolutely terrible. So these ideas translate equally well into any language whatsoever. Hebrew poetry is the only poetry on the planet that translates into every other language while still retaining its poetic character. That's cool. I think God had something to do with that. I think God lined it up that way. So poetry is the attempt to express in words that which cannot be expressed in words. It uses imagery, allusion, references to thing to bring forth pictures and connections inside your heart and your mind. It's not always rational. Lots of times it's very emotional in here. So as we're going along through this psalm, this poem that starts the book, the hymn book for God's people through the ages, It's not by chance that it's the first one. And the subject is not by chance. Blessed is the man that it says right off the bat. Well, by golly, if you were a good little Jewish kid and you were paying attention when they sent you to school, that's going to immediately remind you of the blessings. And what's the opposites? The cursings. And if you have the blessings and the cursings, well, where are you going to find a chapter about that? Anybody know? Where's that? Well, you could, but a Jewish kid's not going to think about that. He would think about Deuteronomy. He would think about Deuteronomy chapter 28. Remember that? It's, got, it's a really long chapter. Of course, we're the ones that divvied it up into chapters. God didn't. But it's kind of a long chapter, and about the first third of it is the blessings, the blessings of obedience. You cannot regain through sacrifice what you have lost through disobedience. Saul learned that. So about the first third is the blessings of obedience, and the other two-thirds are the curses of disobedience. And I can tell you what, I don't want those. So when you see this, blessed is the man, immediately you ought to think about the opposite of that, the curses too. Well, I don't want those. I want the blessings. And what is it? It says, blessed is the man who, look at this, walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Now, if I was uh, still in a classroom and I had a blackboard behind me, here, I've got a virtual blackboard right here, all right? So I'm going to write on the virtual blackboard. I'm going to write walks and counsel and ungodly. And then on the second line under it, I'm going to walk stands, path, sinners. You following me? Walks, counsel, ungodly. Stands, path, sinners. Sits, seat, scornful. Now when you line this up in that matrix like that, you're going to see a progression, a progression going across and a progression running from top to bottom in each column too. Because that first one, walks, stands, sits. You know what this is about? This is about the progression of the development of relationship. And it's what we do. 
We were made to be in relationship. God made us to be in relationship with him. And he made us to be in relationship with one another. That's why Jesus told that parable about the Good Samaritan. We are in relationship with one another. Everybody else on the planet. Not just the people that look like us and smell like us and eat the kind of food that we like. Everybody. And it don't matter what religion, what culture, or, I'm sorry, what political group they may come from. We're in relationship with everybody. And you get to decide whether it's good relationship or destructive relationship. And that's not mostly based upon them. That's based upon you. That's how you approach this. And so you see this to, to, to walk and to stand and to sit. Sometimes, hey, wherever you work, when things were normal and we went into the office, and you, you would like walk with people while you're going along and you might talk to them. And then if you begin to establish a relationship, you'll stop and you'll stand and you'll talk. You ever done that? And stand there for several minutes or some of us, hours, and talk. Sometimes two old men will stop and they don't even have to be old men talking over the back of the tailgate of the pickup truck. But then we'll decide, it's like, hey, why don't we go sit, get something to eat? Now, I don't know. Now, maybe you stand to eat, but at my house, most of the time, we sit down to eat. It's more efficient and more effective. You can use both hands. <laughs> so you see this progression to walk and then to stand and then to sit. And when you're sitting, you can spend a whole lot more time together sitting than in any other way. Who are you choosing to spend your time with? Now, I'm not suggesting that we should only hang around with church folk because I've lived in that little ivory tower and that little enclosed rose garden, and that is not why Jesus saved us. He saved us to send us out so that we can influence others. But you've got to be particular about which way the influence is running. Is the influence running from them to you or from you to them? Way too often we are like a glass of milk. You know, if you pour a glass of milk and you made a pot of chili and you stick the chili in the fridge and you set the milk by it, isn't it astonishing? Next morning the chili tastes just like milk, huh? Oh, not quite. Yeah, the milk tastes like cumin and chili powder and onion. And I remember one of my Sunday school teachers giving an image of this. It's like, well, you know, we want to help our friends. Well, yeah, but what's, if you're laying on the table and they're laying on the, uh, on the floor, is it easier for you to pull them up or for them to pull you down? Now, again, I'm not suggesting that we don't hang around with people who need help and need to have the light of the gospel shown into their lives, but we need to be thoughtful about that. We need to be particular about that. I've been working in a prison for 20 years. That's what I do. I'm a prison chaplain. And I learned a long, long time ago that most of the people that I'm working among are hot with really serious infectious diseases. They've got AIDS, HIV, Hep C, tuberculosis, all kinds of wonderful stuff. So this whole thing about, oh, when, when, when the uh, COVID thing first started coming down, I saw this thing on Facebook, and it says, we're so glad that everyone has learned to wash their hands. Next week, we're going to work on shapes and colors. I've been washing my hands for two decades before I touch my face or pour a cup of coffee or anything. So, that's, so that was just usual, and I think it's the same way as we walk around. Why do you think it talks about the armor of the Spirit? What, is that something you put on for a parade? You don't put on armor to march in a parade. You put on armor to go to work. And the work, we're called to be His witnesses in the world. So this walks is an image of the way you live, your manner of your everyday life. Boy, I wish I had a blackboard up here. See, I, had, see, see, I, I wrote my notes. I put the words on there, and I started scribbling the other no, words around there. So for walks, you can have live, our manner of life. For that counsel, that is the advice or purpose that you can have. The conversation, your talk, your communication, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Snapchat, whatever else. I'm not so good on those. I've decided that my opinion on everything is not the most important thing to toss out there. I've decided that the love of Jesus Christ and some positive input is the most important thing that I can put out there. Amen. 
I don't have to open my mouth and give my opinion because my opinion don't give life. His word gives life. And about Jesus, I mean, he had, he had some strong feelings on some stuff. And when he gave it, it was backed up by the word and the spirit of God. But it says they marveled at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. What kind of words are coming out of us? And that word ungodly, the word in Hebrew actually means those who are wicked, those who are hostile to God. But I remember reading this and thinking about this years ago on this. You know, to be ungodly, it does not necessarily mean to be purposefully wicked. Like running around doing bad stuff, killing people, hurting things, stealing, destroying. Ungodly literally means, in English, living like there is no God. Now, you know, somebody can think that there is no God and they can still live a moral and an ethical life. Philosophy teaches us that. Philosophy is not a bad thing. Zen Buddhism is more of a philosophy than a religion and it's like, uh, you know, you ought to be at peace and you ought to treat others decent. Wow, that sounds a lot like another book I read. But to live as though there's no God... To be ungodly. I don't want to live like there is no God. That would be like me living like Cynthia is not my wife. I remember, since I like to read history, I remember an old saying it, uh, from the days of when in the 1880s and afterwards when men were traveling around as salesmen, they said, no man's married 100 miles from home. That's quite literally a hell of a way to live your life. I've decided that no matter where on the planet, nay, I, I used to put it, no, any place inside the orbit of the moon, then I decided God might want to take me to Mars or wherever else, so I couldn't just say I'm always going to be married no matter where I am on the planet. I'm mar ma married no matter where I am in the universe or out of it. Are you a servant of God all the time, everywhere, no matter where you are? Better be. If you know Jesus, if he's your Lord and Savior, Lord, that means boss. That means master. That means the one that you listen to and follow. I ain't talking salvation here. You understand that? You cannot by works earn your salvation. There is nothing you can do to earn your salvation because there is nothing good inside of us. There is none righteous, no, not one. But if you belong to him, then we are supposed to act like it and live like it and be like it and speak like it and walk like it and touch like it. So when we're standing in that path, to stand means to remain, to endure, to tarry, to abide. I want you to know, Cynthia and I, so far as we understand, we're not just visiting because we were 18 and a half years in Nevada and now we've moved just a couple blocks down the street. We have no intent whatsoever of going through that moving process again anytime soon. <laughs> we came to tarry. We came to abide. We came to put down some roots. And we are, by the way, so delighted that God led us to this church and to this group of people. Thank you for loving us and taking us in. It's cool. It's really cool. So we're st standing, remaining, abiding in that, that path, that way, that, that road, that direction, that manner or course of life. And sinners, then that winds up being the offenders, those who do not follow the word. And the word literally in the Hebrew there is Torah which usually gets defined as just the uh, first five books of the uh, Old Testament, the Mosaic books. I figure all the words came out of God's mouth and it's good for us, so I don't put it in categories of good, better, and best. I put it all in the category of excellent, and I try to eat some of all of it on a regular basis. And that city, so 
goes into that idea of dwelling and abiding. It's a little bit of a different word. It means to inhabit. Interestingly, it even means to marry. That's getting really close. That's a stand, establishing really substantial relationship. That seat, again, that means dwelling and abode too. The assembly, the location where you are. And scornful, a mocker, a scoffer, someone who is boastful. Someone who is ungrateful and unthankful. Wow, that makes me think about 2 Timothy 3, 2. I wasn't gonna, but, but I think I will if I can find it in, in this Bible. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Did you know that we are in the last days? And we are not in the last days because some TV evangelist preacher said so. And if you'll call 1-800 and have your Visa or Master Charge card ready, that, that, that don't put us in the last days. We've been in the last days since the advent of the Messiah. That's what this book says. And in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Oh, but they're religious because having a form of godliness, but they deny the power. Oh, how sad. How impoverishing. From such people turn away. That's what Paul said. We've got to be particular with this and how we're hanging out and who we're hanging out with. My notes are sticking together. And it says, the delight of the one who is blessed... His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. They say from the moment that you wake up, you set your day. How do you wake up? Do you have one of those aggravating things by your bed that at a really unpleasant time in the morning it starts going, ah, 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 ah. and do you roll over and do you tap it gently and say, good morning, Lord. Or do you smack it and go, oh, good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> we start from the very get-go with the self-talk, programming ourselves for how we're going to face the day. And what do you think on when you're left to your own devices? Those who are apart from God, they think about what they want. They think about their own desires. They think about their own will and Oh me, oh my, my own toes hurt because I'm supposed to belong to Jesus and so often my ideas go to my, me, mine. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You can do what's right in your eyes if you want to, but that is not the path of life. You best be doing what is right in the eyes of he who sits upon the throne. He's the one who will lead us and guide us. So what do you think on? What's the recurring thought in your mind when you're awakened in the night? What does your mind immediately go to? Do you know you can train your mind? It's not easy. But you, it says, taking every thought captive, that's the kind of language that Greek cowboys use because the language there is to take a rope and put it on a steer and drag his unwilling backside into a corral. That's the language that they use there to take every thought captive. It's like the, it's the language in there is very close to, taking, to, to compelling something to go into an enclosure where it don't want to go. They did cattle and sheep did, then, same as people do today. So when that thought pops up, you've got to grab it and put it down. And when that thought pops up, you grab it and you put it down. And when that thought pops up, you grab it and you put it down. When you start this, you will probably be doing that uh, three times a second. It gets better. You can get to where you're only putting it down once every three seconds. And if you keep on with that, then it will come the day that that intruding, unpleasant, 
thought that keeps coming back again that's dogging you, that you'll only be putting it down every once in a while. And then it'll suddenly occur to you that, oh, I don't even remember the last time that went through my head. But you are the one that's in charge of what's inside your head. God made you that way. That's a whole other message, though. It says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers, the courses, the streams of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does will prosper. Wouldn't you like that? I would. I would like that whatever I put my hand to, that God bring forth excellence through me. We lived in Montana about 25 years ago, a little place called Big Timber, right at the foot of the Crazy Mountains. Named the Crazy Mountains, that's the shortened version. It was the Crazy Woman Mountains because the wagon train or the wagon apparently got attacked by Indians and everybody else was killed except for her, and she went nuts and lived in the mountains. Wow. Beautiful mountains, though. I got a bear hide on the bed that I collected from up there. There was this campground up in the middle of it, Half Moon Campground. And one day, they, the, the kids in school took a field trip up there, and the wildlife biologists uh, from the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries up there went with them. And, also it, and it was from several agencies. And I don't remember if I was subbing in school that day or if I just tagged along because our kids were in the class. But I remember we were up there. It was so beautiful, gorgeous mountains, snow-capped for much of the year. And there's this one place, this stream is running down through there. And it goes through this channel in this rock. And it's great to look at. Don't want to be in it. That would hurt. It would be cold. It would scrape all the skin off of you, dragging you down through the stone. But I mean, it was just beautiful. It comes roaring out. And then it calms down a little bit. And here, it kind of slows down and turns into a, a creek that's nice and placid, a wide pool of water. And here's a tree. It's like a pinion pine growing right by it. And this thing's probably six, eight feet in diameter at the butt. And uh, how tall? I don't know, 125, 150 feet tall? It's astonishing. And the, one of the wildlife biologists called all the class of the children around and was teaching them a lesson. And she says, you see this tree right here? She says, you see that little tree over there that's on top of that pile of rocks on top of those boulders over there? This is exactly the same kind of tree. But that tree that was over there away from the water, it was no bigger around than my forearm and only about that tall. And she said, we've determined through core samples that both of these trees are exactly the same age. Wow, and I mean, and this verse like you know, upside the head. I mean, what an image. Be like a tree that's planted by the streams of water, where you're being constantly fed by that living water of the Spirit. You could have built four houses out of the lumber you'd have got off that one tree. That other little one over there wouldn't have made a walking stick. Same age. Same location, separate, separated by 35, 40 feet maybe. Mm. I want my toes, my roots down deep in the living water. That's what I want. I want that deep in there. And it says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. You know what chaff is? It's that stuff that's on the wheat that's not any good to eat. And so what you got to do before you can do anything with it you got to get the chaff off of it. Now, we lived up in the Dakotas for a while, too. Now, I want you to know they got wheat fields up there. They got wheat fields that are the size of this state, you know. They got big wheat fields up there. And it's great. I, I, I once camped in the edge of a wheat field in the back of my little Jeep coming back from a chaplain's conference. And all night long, you could smell that wonderful aroma coming off of the wheat. It almost smelled like fresh, fresh baked bread. And, but you'd go out there and you'd break off heads of wheat. And you'd do like this and get that chaff off. And then you could chew on the wheat, wheat seeds. It was great. It was good. They were tasty. And if you baked them, you parched them. Ah, oh, they're even better. Now, it says that the ungodly are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Now, what's the opposite of that? The godly 
are like the precious grains of wheat, which are cleaned and purified and gathered and retained and gathered into God's own garner, into God's own silo, where God can then make out of it whatever he desires. He can make bread, or he can make crackers, or he can make cake, or he can make roux, or he can make whatever out of it he wants to. What's God making out of us? Because I say, like, you know, this is opposites in Hebrew poetry. As you're reading this, when you see the ungodly are like the chaff, well, it ought to leap to your mind that the godly then are like the grains of wheat. That's what God's doing with us. And we are not distressed or dislodged by the wind. Now, when God's holy wind, when the holy wind of the Spirit comes blowing through us, yeah, that can blow us around any place he wants to. But I'm talking about how about the wind of the weather, the wind of vagaries, or the wind of fashion. We don't need to be blown around by that. We need to be firmly established and not dismayed by the little things that come. And it's all little things that come. The only big thing comes from God. And he's got it all well in hand. Right here. God's got it in hand. And it says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The ungodly do not stand in the judgment. That means they can't abide it. They can't endure it. It knocks them down. Guess what? Do you know that we stand in judgment? If you, a follower of Jesus Christ, you get to stand in judgment. Oh, it's not the kind of judgment I'm going, I don't know. Hell or heaven? What do you say, Dad? do not say that. If you follow Jesus, that, that is already decided before you get there. You know, as Christians, most of the time, we fear the idea of standing in judgment. And I suppose, well, we should, because we know that our sins are like filthy rags, and he's the only righteous one. But don't you understand that he came and he already gave his blood for you and me? And he's doing everything. Hey, we, Matthew led us in a song about that just a little bit ago. That God is running after us to overwhelm us with his goodness. So that when we go and we stand in his presence for judgment, I'm not going to say you're not going to be terrified because, hey, when he burns everything up in fervent heat, I'm pretty much sure I'm going to freak. But I'm not going to freak out like somebody who don't know him. I'm going to freak out. It's kind of like, wow, this is wild. The whole universe is getting heated up and recast and remade. Wow, I ain't never seen anything like that before, Lord. But I'm not going to be terrified like somebody that doesn't know him because this is my friend, my Lord, my Savior, the one who walks alongside of me, the one that I want to put up on a pedestal and he won't stay there. He keeps climbing down off of it going, hey, look, I am Emmanuel. I'm God right alongside you. So when we stand in judgment, have you ever had an annual evaluation before? A good annual evaluation, like the coach. Like the coach who says, well, you've got this pretty good, but, you know, if you do this a little bit better. Now, I, I am not sporting. I, I am the clumsiest ball player you would ever want to see. But when we got, first got married, we were teaching in a private school down in Baton Rouge. So many of our kids were in sports there. And as astonishing as this sounds to anybody who knows how I am with baseball, I became a batting coach for a little bit. Because I saw what the coach did. He, he just wanted me to feed the balls in there in the batting cage where the guys could do it. Well, I started to learn about this. And, and it depends on how you hold the bat and, and where this elbow is and, this, and where your feet are. And I learned about that a little bit. Now, that's been th 34 years ago now, so I don't remember a whole lot about it. But I rem one of the things that I remember... And I, once I learned these few little things, I could give pointers to the guys and improve their batting. This is what God wants to do with you. When we stand before him, he is your loving maker and creator who wants to help you improve your game. And whatever the game is that he's got planned for you. Or did you think that when this life is over with, we just sit around all day long on clouds eating bonbons and playing harps? Now, I hope that there's time for that. 
But I think he's got plan and purpose for us, and, it's not, and it doesn't end when our earthly life here ends, because there is life everlasting. There is more to it. And I don't know what that's going to look at, but I know that God loves life. And he made us with abilities. He put those inside of us. He put the gifts and the talents and abilities inside of you. Did you think that he did that only so you could use it for 50, 60, 70 years, and then poof, it's going to go away? This is training ground. I do not know what he's got planned because eye has not seen and ear has not heard the good things he has planned for them who love him. That's both here and now and in the hereafter. So for the obedient child of God, the eschaton, the end of time, that's not a time of fear and terror. It's a homecoming. It's a family reunion of healing, of completion, perfection. The world is ending. Yes, praise God. This is great. He shows up. Listen, we're invited to a party. There's going to be grilled meat. I've got it on good. There's grilled meat. And there's a pool there. They talk, John talked about that in the Revelation. It's a big pool, too. So there's a grill. There's a big pool. You don't even have to dress up because he's got party clothes to give you. A, a, a new robe. And a new name, a whole new identity. And then you don't have to, after having a week, a few days or a week at the resort, you don't have to go back. You get to stay. So tell me again how this is a bad thing. God's got so much planned for us. And he wants us to begin walking, living, acting right now in such a way as to guide and direct ourselves toward that. You see, that's the message of the apocalypse, of Revelation that you mentioned. You know where you stand determines what you see? That's true in life. Because if you're standing right here, you know, it, uh, you know, you might not see something over there. You might have to walk to another place to see this other thing. You know, what you see when you read Revelation depends on where you stand in relation to Jesus Christ. So many people read Revelation and they freak out about all the bad stuff. Well, what about that recurrent thing about the Lamb of God who's standing in the center of all things and everything's being lined up in accordance with His will and worship of Him? That's what I pay attention to. But you know, if you're getting sucked off into following the world, yeah, it ought to fill you with a little bit of consternation when you read the book. Because that is not what He intended for you to do. This is not about perfection. This is about obedience. This is about obedience. He's the one who makes us able. But you've got to engage your will to choose to walk in obedience after him. The Holy Spirit's there to help you do that. He calls the sheep, not sponges. A sponge just sits on a log in the water and waits for whatever the waves are going to bring it so it can eat. Sheep at least get to walk around. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his sheep, the sheep of his flock, of his pasture. And he is making something of us. He's making something of you. What? I don't know. If you ask him, he says, call, call upon me and I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's out of Jeremiah. That's promise. You want to know what God's doing? Ask him. And if you ask him, you might get the response was, I was wondering how long it was going to take for you to ask that question. Ask him. Give me a dream for my life. Give me guidance. Give me direction. It says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. He's omniscient. That means all-knowing. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Those words used to cause me problems. Doubt. I didn't have a problem with him being omnipotent. If he's the Almighty, he is all powerful. And about being omnipresent, being everywhere, well, I get that, and omniscient, knowing any, everything. But if he is all powerful and all knowing and all good, then how in the world could he love the likes of me? But he does. 
I never doubted the existence of God, but I have doubted how he could possibly love me. And you know what his response has been consistently through my life? Not to thunder out of a ball of fire on top of a mountain, to continue to come alongside and go, come on, James, get up, walk with me. Come on, come on, man, you can do this, walk with me. I'm here with you, walk with me. He will never leave you, he will never forsake you, he will never let you go. So in close, I would like to read a positive restatement of the psalm, if you will. You could turn around and make it negative and say, Cursed is the man who walks in the counsel of the ungodly, who stands in the path of the sinners. But I like the idea of casting the whole thing into positive mode. And I guess that's okay, because that's the way we write song lyrics so often. So blessed is the child of God who lives in the counsel and the advice of the godly, who abides in the life path of the obedient, who dwells in the seat, the presence of those who are grateful, who are thankful. For her delight is in the living word of the Lord, and by the Holy Spirit she keeps the things of God in mind. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, rooted rooted and grounded immovably in the rock, at the set time bringing forth abundant fruit, vibrant, green, lush, and full, prospering in everything he does, for he's following the will of the Lord. She is valued by her maker and is like rich, fertile, nutritious grain, gathered, cleaned, and kept with care. Looking forward with earnest, hopeful expectation to standing in the presence of the one who redeemed her in love. The Lord knows who you are. He knows where you are. And he knows what you are facing. All your ways are written in his book. And he holds you in his hand until you finally stand in his very presence and see him face to face. I don't know how to do that, you might say. You ain't got to know how to do that. Ask him. and He'll do it in you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, you know what sometimes, Lord, it seems like we face the slings and stones of outrageous fortune in this life. But remind us that none of this is a surprise to you, that you've got it all well in hand. That you not only know where we are, but you know where you're bringing us. So I ask, O Lord, that you pour out your spirit on us in abundant measure. That you lead us and guide us to walk after you in obedience, in power, in love. Let us not please ourselves, but please, Lord, help us to please you. So many people talk about what a challenging year this has been. All years are challenging, Lord, because we're just flesh. And today we're blooming, and tomorrow it says we're thrown into the oven, burned up. Well, in this fleeting time that we have, help us to redeem the time. For though the days may be evil, Lord, yet your spirit and your power is good. You know, my brothers and my sisters here, Lord, those who need a touch of healing, those who just need to hear that still small voice again, speak to them, Lord. Wrap us in your arms. Whisper those words of love and encouragement. (laughs) Kick us in the rear end if you need to. Do anything with us you wish. Just don't leave us alone. That's what Moses said, wasn't it? 
I'll go down, but you got to go with me because you're the only thing that makes us different from anybody else on the planet. You are, Lord, the only thing that makes us different. May we walk as your anointed servants. In the sweet, blessed, holy name we do pray. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Do I need to do anything else? Y'all have a... What's that? I will sing of the goodness of God. All my days you have been faithful. When it rolls around here. Where's Matthew? He's going to help me. Oh! <laughs> sing it! Let's sing it a few times through. <laughs>